Are you ready for an open discussion with the best of the best and the best of what's next? Welcome to the Tony D'Urso Show. Join in on a great conversation today with some of the world's great influencers as they showcase great advice and techniques that made them the game changers they are today. Now, here's Tony D'Urso. Welcome, I'm your host, Tony Dierso. I want to thank you so much for being with us today as we take a deep dive into surviving a startup. Now, whether your company is a startup now or it's rock and rolling, remember, it was a startup at some point. And there may be some gems here that you can learn to help make your company grow a whole lot faster, no matter how successful it may be right now. And that's what this interview is actually all about. It's about helping you Take your vision to reality. Now, I want you to be ready to take some notes as there's a lot to cover today. And if you like what you're hearing, please share this with friends that you believe would be helped by this. All right. You know this. It's all about friends helping friends. And we need that more than ever today, don't we? So let's check this out. Meet Stephen Hoffman. He's a venture investor, CEO of Founders Space, and he's the founder of three venture-backed startups as well as the author of several award-winning books, such as Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. He runs a truly global startup accelerator with over 50 partners in 22 countries. And I'm going to let him tell you all about it and fill that in. Let's find out more. Hi, Stephen. Welcome to the Tony D'Urso Show. So glad to have you with us today. Tony, it's fantastic to be here. The honor is mine, my friend. And, you know, we're all looking forward to learning more about how to survive a startup. And we got a lot of questions about this. I gave a little itsy bitsy little bio on you. Can you fill it in for us, Stephen? How did it all start for you? For me, I've actually done three venture funded startups in Silicon Valley and two bootstrap startups. So I've been in the trenches. I know what entrepreneurs entrepreneurs go through. I've had my own experiences, the ups and the downs. And then after my third venture funded startup, I founded Founderspace, which is a global startup accelerator. So I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs on all aspects of their business. And I'm also an author. I've written three books, Make Elephants Fly, which is all about the process of radical innovation, Surviving a Startup, which is also the name of the show and my book, which is exactly about that, and the five forces that change everything, which is about how technology like AI, CRISPR gene editing, brain computer interfaces, the metaverse are going to change business and our lives. You know, Stephen, I like that the five forces, and that may be the title of another interview. I'm really intrigued by that. And so I have to stay on point, however, on surviving a startup. And I get that you've done a lot. You, you're very successful, as we've talked about. Somewhere along the line, you had this vision you're, that you realized that you're good on startups. You can help others on startups. Can you take us into that where you decided, hey, this is the career. This is the path I'm going to go and, and help other startups. Well, I'd done a lot of startups, and I actually didn't expect to do this. Really, I was just taking a break. I, I had finished my third venture-funded startup my friends started to come to me and my nickname in Silicon Valley is Captain Hoff. So they were all like, Captain, help me. I know you raised a lot of money. How do you do it? How do you put together the investor deck? How do you pitch investors? Where do you go? How do you scale your company? All those basic questions. So I started to share my wisdom and I found that a lot of entrepreneurs have similar questions. So I posted my answers on my blog, Founder Space, and more and more entrepreneurs kept coming. Eventually, we opened up an office in San Francisco where we've been training and accelerating startups, and then we expanded globally. So we have you know, partners all over the world, and pre-COVID times, I was traveling 70% of the time. Absolutely amazing. And you know, that leads into a, a question I have. You're very successful. You could be traveling all the time. You could be sailing. You could be in... Mauritius now, you could be in in the Bahamas, you could be anywhere and just hanging out for the rest of your life, but yet you're doing this 
you're helping startups, you're doing a lot of training, you're all over the place. So the question is, why are you doing this? What's the purpose behind this? Well, I'd love it. So first of all, every time you engage with an entrepreneur, you get to enter their world. You get to see the world through their eyes and they usually see something you don't. So all the entrepreneurs, I'm teaching them, like I'm, because I see patterns. I see why businesses go wrong, the problems they have, you know, the challenges they face. I've, I'm used to helping them get over those obstacles, but they're also teaching me. They're teaching me about their business, about their vision, about what they see the future has in store. And we form great relationships. It's something that it's, to me, my job is my hobby. So I'm basically retired, but I'm working all the time. I love it. We're talking with Stephen Hoffman about surviving a startup, and you can find him at founderspace.com. Just because it's a little tricky, it's founders with an S. That's F-O-U-N-D-E-R-S-S-P-A-C-E.com. Founderspace.com. Is that right? That is correct. And actually, you can get there with one or two S's. You can misspell it and still get there. Oh, well, there you go. So that, that's very good on there. So, all right, found their space. Now, Stephen, I've got like 52,000 questions about this. There's so much to ask about startup. So I'm going to try to knock out some of the key questions, hopefully in a little bit of an order. And I think one of the, one of the first things I want to hit is most, we hear it all the time. I talk about it in, in some of my keynote speeches. Most businesses fail. And there's this there's this myth, there's myths about launching a startup. So let's take it from there. And what are some of the biggest myths about launching a startup? And let's, let's see where we go. I'll give you one of the biggest ones. So one of the biggest is that your idea at the beginning is the most important thing. So many entrepreneurs, like they won't even take the leap before they think they have that magic idea, that epiphany that's going to propel them to become a unicorn. Well, honestly, this is a big fallacy. Because most of the time you start off with one idea and you end up somewhere totally different you didn't expect. So if you don't believe me, I'll just give you a couple examples of real world. YouTube, we all know YouTube. However, YouTube did not begin allowing people to share their videos. YouTube actually began as a video dating site. So they were a dating site in the early days of video with broadband. And they thought, well, people love to date, people love video, this will be a big hit. But video dating, of course, didn't work. So their company was actually failing. And they, they were actually, you know, just trying to figure out what to do. And at one point, they had a personal video they wanted to share with their friends. And they're like, oh, I could actually upload that to our dating site and just share the link and everybody can watch it there. Boom. That simple magic thing they discovered, which wasn't a big idea. It wasn't like, we're going to be the biggest video broadcast network in the world. They did. That's not how they started. They started totally different. They shared the link and then they're, uh, we all know history, right? That was it. You look at other sites like Google, right? When Google started, if you talk to Larry Page and Sergey Brin, they would have told you they were doing a nonprofit, which is ironic given Google is one of the most profitable country companies in the history of the world. How could they be doing a nonprofit? What does that mean? Um, well, they were basically, their mission was to help academics find research papers online. And you know, that's a pretty niche market, especially in the early days of the internet. There just weren't that many academics, you know, looking for research papers. It was a nice tool to have. It was only after they had built a really sophisticated engine for searching the web, that they realized, wow, we could broaden our focus. We could find all information online. But even the founders of Google didn't see how big it would be. They were, there was a company that no longer exists called Excite at Home. And Excite at Home came to them and said, hey, we want to, we, we, we're, we're kind of interested in your company. And they jumped on that and they tried to sell Google for $750,000, which to two grad students was a good chunk of money. But, you know, Excite at Home said, nah, we're not going to buy you. <laughs> well, the rest is history. So what I tell entrepreneurs, and this is my specific advice to entrepreneurs, don't get fixated on your idea at the beginning. In fact, it's far, far better 
to come up with a lot of ideas in a certain area that you're interested in innovating on. Then you don't get locked into one that most likely before you've gone out and really tested it probably won't work. So you start to experiment with all these different ideas and then you find out which ones actually resonate, which ones are actually meeting a demand out there in the marketplace. You know, the next question I'm going to ask you here has changed so much prior to what I call the madness of 2020 and what's going on today. Prior to that, more more and more of the people that I've run into, even though I am in the entrepreneurial circles, more people, they like their career, they like that cushy job, and they're very steadfast. They want that, they want that standard pay. They want to work their 40 hours or whatever. They, they kind of hedge against being an entrepreneur. Different people, they fall into it. They, they decide to try it. They hack their day job. But today it's different. I think you have to be an entrepreneur no matter what happens because there is no security with your job. And we have people that are, we want them to feel good of, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. I've made the right choice. But there's things that an entrepreneur has to know. And if you haven't taken that step or that leap, you have to know. And I want to talk about what do you have to do to be that entrepreneur at the very beginning? Oh, well, it is brutal. <laughs> Let me tell you, being an entrepreneur is not easy. So if you have that cushy job, uh, you're right to think carefully before making the leap. Now, I'm not saying don't be an entrepreneur, but I'm saying you need to have a couple things lined up. So the first is you have to have enough cash to be able to go a year. Don't think it's you're going to get funded in a month or two or things are just going to magically take off. At least a year. You also have to know yourself. Like certain people are perfect for being an entrepreneur. They can handle uh, they can handle stress well because there's a lot of stress. They're very flexible. They can change direction quickly. They don't need things, you know, ordered and everything planned out in the future because you never have a plan or your plan is always changing. So you have to have the right personality to actually jump into this. And then you have, I tell entrepreneurs, do an idea. If it's your first company, if you're not Elon Musk, already famous, do an idea that you can bootstrap, that you can actually do at least to the point where you can prove it works. Because if you can't get to that point, honestly, really hard to raise capital, really hard. And uh, once you... Raising capital in Silicon Valley, I'm an investor now. I will tell you it's binary. It's either investors are swarming all over you to give you money and you're pushing them away or nobody wants to talk to you. So it's sort of one or the other. And the difference is those entrepreneurs who can actually go to investors and actually take them into their business and really show them that they have figured out something that nobody else has figured out. And more than that, there's a huge demand for it. I like to say great entrepreneurs are great demand hunters. They're not people who come up with the best ideas, like I said before. Like Elon Musk, who we all admire, he didn't uh, found Tesla. That was somebody else's company. Uber wasn't founded by Kalanick. It was founded by somebody else. Great entrepreneurs are actually great, really, really good at identifying opportunities at the right time, moving on them and executing on them. Those are the skills you need. Those are excellent points there. And when that person becomes that entrepreneur, there's some very key, there's some deadly mistakes that they can make. Let's bring them out and how to, how to deal with them. Okay. There are a lot of mistakes you can make. And I'll tell you a story about my first venture funded startup. So I made a lot of those mistakes. So the first mistake I made with my venture funded startup is called Spider Dance. We had this amazing technology. It was massively multiplayer gaming platform that our lead engineer had built out and owned the IP to. So it sounded amazing. Like I was in the game space. I'd come out of, I'd done my own game company and this was my second gaming venture. My first one was bootstrapped, very successful. Thought I want to do something bigger on the internet. So we all partnered up. I partnered with three different partners. The, we had this incredible technology. 
but we made the mistake that we were in search of a market. Like a lot of times you'll start with technology, but technology, it doesn't matter. What I learned is it doesn't matter what technology you have. It matters what that technology can do for somebody else. Like you can have the best technology in the world, works perfectly, absolutely amazing. But if you don't put it, if you can't figure out where somebody's really going to use it, then it's just a piece of technology. I went out into the marketplace at first and I looked around. So uh, I thought, oh, we have this amazing gaming engine. We could build our own game, but we don't have a lot of money. And this game, uh, this it would be much more profitable and safer if we made it a platform. And we got all these other game developers who at that time, there weren't, there were hardly any multiplayer games around. Very, very few online. So we said, oh, everybody should have a multiplayer game. We'll, we'll make a platform. They'll get on. I went out to all the developers, started talking to them. And what I discovered was this, and this is another really important lesson. I went to them and most of them were like, oh, that's interesting. Hey, that's pretty nice. That's cool. But you know what? They were at that point in time, they were making money off single player games. There wasn't a huge demand for multiplayer because simply there was there it was hard. People weren't doing it. So most of them would be like, well, if you could give it to me for free, I'll do it. Or I'll give you a little bit of rev share to, to do it. And I, suddenly it dawned on me pretty early, you know, a couple months into this. Nobody's going to pay us much money. Like, and they wanted everything customized. So it was a dead end. We had this great technology and no business. So we pivoted which is what I recommend. Like, you know, after two months, we were like, we're not going to get make much from these developers. And it's going to be a huge amount of work. We're too early. So we pivoted. And at that time, it was the early days of the internet. JavaScript had just come out and we saw an opportunity. People love to chat online. And we thought, wow, people love to chat. People love games. What if we combined them and made this plugin called Jabber Chat, where you could chat and play games at the same time? And we developed this, we put it out there, websites started to pick it up, hundreds of websites started to use it. We won the South by Southwest contest, number one. And we were like on top of the world. We're like, this is amazing. It's growing like crazy. The second thing we ran into, so this time we had adoption, but we needed to monetize this. Like there was no, you know, nobody's going to pay for a little plugin, although all these websites were using it. So we thought, ah, ad revenue ad revenue. And we found this company. They no longer exist today, but they were like a pre-Google <laughs> for ads. And they had built a platform for ads, for serving up banner ads. And we integrated that with our platform. We put it out there. Now we were like, okay, we have so many websites using this. We're going to get a huge check at the end of the month. So we're waiting, we're waiting and the check comes in and we're like very excited. We rip open the envelope. We look at it. Oh my God. It's $13 and 60 cents. It's not enough to go out for pizza for the team. We are making, we made this in a, what? We were like, oh my God. So we had an incredible uh, platform adoption. We had a uh, ad model, but the problem is nobody was buying ads. This was the early days of the internet, you know, pre Google. People weren't spending money on ads. So we literally could not make that business model work. Now, who knows if we stuck it out, what would have happened? But we didn't have time. <laughs> like we had already wasted, you know, spent a bunch of time early on. This was our, sec our, our first pivot. We we're like, we have to figure something out that will actually be a business. That is when we heard through the grapevine that MTV was looking to launch their first interactive TV program. Basically, it was a show called Web Riot with Amit Zappa as the host, music trivia game show. And they wanted somebody to develop a platform, basically, where they could have an online portion where people could play along in real-time synchronization, frame accurate, with the TV show. So we didn't have the technology for this yet. We just had the, the massively multiplayer engine. But we just got on the phone because we were desperate. We start calling MTV and leaving messages on the voicemail of the senior vice president saying, hey, we've got your, you know, technology. <laughs> We're called Spider Dance. Call us back. And guess what happened? 
College the of senior, the, Yeah, the senior vice president of MTV totally ignored us. Never oh. called us back. We didn't get any calls back. So, you know, but we're entrepreneurs. And my friend, my partner, Tracy, she was invited to speak at CES from her previous job before we did the startup, but she kept that slot on a panel. So she went to speak at CES and she starts talking about how we're planning to build this interactive TV platform that will sync television and the internet and all this stuff. And after her talk, some guy comes running up from the audience, pushes through everybody, comes right up to her, gets in her face and says, I need to talk to you. You have exactly what <laughs> we want. I am the senior vice president of MTV. <laughs> of all the people in the audience. And she looks at him and she goes, I know, we've been leaving voice messages for <laughs> the past month. So literally, literally, uh, you know, a few weeks later, we had $350,000 in the bank. That was the boots. That's what made our company go. And uh, we found somebody who had this, what I call extreme demand. They absolutely needed what we had. We were at the right place at the right time. But, you know, that was just the beginning of our adventure. Like all startups, there's so much more. Uh, I could talk about that. I could talk about the fundraising process, if you like. I love those stories. And you've mentioned a couple of things you've talked about. And one thing I wanted to comment on, Stephen, is that perhaps you could tweak it. When I do a startup, I've, I've had quite a few that didn't work out. But my focus is always, if I can bootstrap it, if I can run it, if I can make it bring in income, then I can grow it. But that's like, for me, the, the proof in the pudding if, if I, that I can, that it can bring an income. It's sound, it's workable. It, instead of this big idea, you know, where, you know, I, I've spoken to people and some of these ideas are very big, but it involves a lot of money, but you've got to have that proof of concept in place first. You've got, I believe, and you can, you've got more experience on this. I believe it's got to make money and really Role before you can start giving it wings and adding and uh, adding more and more to it. Yeah. So let me tell you, I'll tell you what venture capitalists really look for today in startups. And you got to understand there are different types of startups. So there are linear growth businesses that any of us can start and grow pretty well. In a lot of these, they're like design agencies, they're like consulting firms, things like that, that require human capital, people to grow, people with special expertise. Those tend to be linear growth, you know, slower growth businesses. Venture capital, especially in Silicon Valley, is not looking for that. They are looking for exponential growth. They want these companies that are going to become unicorns overnight. They don't want to wait 20 years for you to become a billion dollar company. That's not their model. So uh, we, uh, when, when you go out, if you're looking, you looking to raise capital, really important to understand what's in the investor's mind. So when investors look at businesses, and some of them seem to make sense, some of them don't. Like some of them are like, when are they going to make money? Well, what they're really looking for is if what the ideal business they want is number one, when you get a customer, when you acquire a customer, you never let that customer go. And that customer continues to pay you over and over and over throughout their lifetime. Now, this might sound like it makes sense, but a lot of businesses aren't this. So for example, if somebody needs your consulting services once and then they go away and they never come back because you did whatever you needed to do for them, uh, very hard to grow. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to go out and have to find other customers because they're not coming back. If uh, they buy a gadget from you, like a lot of these Kickstarter companies, they'll, people come out with this cool gadget, they'll buy it, but then the customer goes away and they have no contact with the customer at that point. These are tough businesses to grow. Because your biggest cost in running a business is one, your employees, the people you have, number two, acquiring customers, your marketing costs. So if you want to have a great business, if you look at Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, doesn't matter what the company is, Twitter, all of them, when they get a customer, they, that customer usually sticks with them a long time and they continue to give that customer value. And in return, the customer gives them either their attention, like on Facebook, an ad model, or their money, like a, a, you know, a lot of other companies. So 
Number one, get that customer. Number two, how do you lock a customer in so that they don't leave? Well, this is really important. Really, what you want to build are not products. I always tell entrepreneurs, don't build products. <laughs> you know, if you want to be successful, build platforms. Platforms are so much more powerful. Now, why are they powerful? Because of a couple of things. If you design a platform right, the more the customer engages with your platform, the more value they create for themselves. Think of Facebook. Every time you're interacting with your friends or posting on it, you're creating value. Think of Amazon. Every time you write a review, you are creating value for yourself. You're like, you know, giving feedback to the, the, the people who, who serviced you or the product. But you're also, even more importantly, you're creating value for the whole community. So the more people you have, the more they engage, the more value they create. Like I go to Amazon primarily for the reviews. Let's be honest. They have more reviews than everybody else, right? That value wasn't created by me. It was created by the entire community. And then they have like a double whammy. They have a marketplace. So the more buyers coming on and creating value, the more it sellers it attracts. And the more sellers it attracts, the more value for the buyers because they get lower prices. That's Amazon's model. Facebook, the more people contributing content, the more valuable for everybody in the ecosystem. Salesforce, a B2B site, they have all these third-party developers creating apps in their platform. You might not think Salesforce is the best CRM software, but once you start using all these third-party things, it's hard to leave. They lock you in. They don't, you can't just take all these third parties and jump to another piece of software. You're stuck on their platform. So when investors look at this model, that is what they're looking for. And I tell entrepreneurs, in, you know, if you want to analyze your business from day one to see if it's the type of business that's going to be exponential growth, look at it. Are, do you have this model? And can it scale? Like software businesses scale really well. Other businesses, really tough to scale. You know, if you need humans with certain talent and there's a limited number of them, very hard to scale those businesses. Hardware businesses can scale, but you also have competition. A lot of people can just take, because you, you can't control it. Software is where you engage customers. In hardware, without the software, you, they can just buy it and use it and never talk to you. You need to have that relationship. All those things combined as an entrepreneur. Think about that when you analyze your own company. I really like that. That really fits very well. Get the platform in place, even if it's just getting the product going and it, it's sustainable, figure out a way to make it into a platform so that the customer, the client can keep coming back and enjoy the experience. I like that a lot. That's a very important point. And by the way, on the spider dance, was that your first big success in your startups or have you told that story yet? So, oh, I can, I'll finish. I'll, I have lots more. So my first big success was my first company that I bootstrapped called Lava Mine. So we did, uh, it was a software game company. We did games. We did this game called Gazillionaire, which is ironically what I do today. I teach people to be entrepreneurs and uh, Gazillionaire was a game where you taught people to be entrepreneurs, all about being an entrepreneur. So. Spider Dance was my first venture funded company. And I, I'll tell you some of the, the trials I went through with Spider Dance, which I think will your user, your listeners can learn a lot from this. So one of the hardest things we faced with Spider Dance is we got a lot of money from MTV. We were building out this product, but we needed venture capital. We needed venture capital because we we had to grow. We were building a platform. And I, people always ask me, when is venture capital really important? Well, venture capital is really important in businesses where you need to get money in early to build out whatever you're doing, but also to acquire more customers, grow and capture the market. So that was our mission. Now, um, raising capital uh, when in my early days was not easy. There were no startup accelerators like we run now in Silicon Valley. There, uh, I didn't know any venture capitalists. So literally, I would just be randomly trying to meet people who had money to invest in our company. And most of these people, I would engage with them. I would talk with them. I'd give them all the information. We had this deal with MTV. And then they would be interested because we had this deal, but they wouldn't commit. I finally 
found a venture capital firm, a big Hollywood VC firm, a new firm by all these studio heads were joining it. Michael Milken was on the board. All these big names were part of that venture firm. I went there and I, we pitched them our company and they said they would invest. They said they would give us $5 million. And we were like, yeah, we got the money. So we retained a very high-end law firm out of Silicon Valley, ran up a $60,000 legal bill, negotiated the whole contract, dotted every I, crossed every T, and then we were done. And we're like, okay, give us the money. You know what they said? Uh-oh. Uh-oh is right. Because they turned to us and they said, you know, your product is only six weeks away from launch. Uh, we're just going to wait. We're like, what? You promised us we, you would give us the money. We need it now. Like we need the money. Like, you know, we, the 350,000 sounded like a lot, but we, we were, it was going, <laughs> it was going really fast. And, but they wouldn't budge. They were like, we're going to wait until it launch. We want to make sure this actually works. We had no choice. And so we were just heads down. We had to launch that product. Now, MTV kept calling us up <laughs> like weekly and saying, you know, TV never goes down. TV doesn't crash. Your product better work when it launches. So now we're under double pressure to make this thing work at launch. And it wasn't like today where we have AWS and you know all these scalable solutions out there. We literally um, had to build it all ourselves. Like it was the first time like a massively multiplayer game was gonna get this much traffic in such a short period of time. And we had a co-location facility in New Jersey and our engineers were in there. They had, we had to buy the hardware. We had to set up everything. And there's no way to load balance test it. The software wasn't there. Like it, it didn't exist. So we, we did our best. We built it out and then we prayed. <laughs> so launch day came, the product's getting ready to launch. You know, MTV has been going nuts too, because this was their big show. Like, so they, their first attempt to do something really online and on air combined them. So they had been doing, barraging the network with advertisements for our, uh, our, for the show Web Riot that they were doing just like day and night, play online, play online, join, it's launching on this date. And we were like scared, crazy, but we didn't tell MTV we <laughs> We were so frightened it wouldn't work. We kept a cool face. We had no choice. We had to, we, we, you know, this is do or die. So we put it up there. The launch day comes, boom, tons of traffic starts coming in, just massive amounts as soon as it's live. Now it's going okay. But a few minutes later, the entire system crashes down. And oh, we're like, no. Oh my God. <laughs> the phone rings. I pick it up. It is the senior vice president of MTV, and he doesn't have enough four-letter words in his vocabulary to spew at me. This thing is down. What is going on? I told you. Blah, 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 blah. I was like, hold on. Hold on. Let me call my engineers. So I get on the phone to the engineers. And I'm like, guys, it's crashed. What's going on? And they were like, you know, we're under attack. It's a denial of service attack. Hackers are bringing down our server. We were like, oh, we didn't have enough problems. <laughs> Hackers are bringing, and they, this wasn't the day where you had firewalls and all this advanced stuff. They were manually rushing around blocking IP addresses one by one. And sitting there, three minutes later, boom, it's back on. They did it. They blocked the denial service attack. Our engineers blocked it. And it ran flawlessly. The whole show, like perfectly. And the show after that, perfectly. No problems. We were like so relieved. Like our product actually launched. We took a huge chance, a gamble. It paid off. Go back to the investors. It launched. It was a huge success. Bigger than anybody thought it would be. You know, where's our money? <laughs> Give us our $5 million. We really need it now. They were like, oh, absolutely. We'll give you the money. You know, we've been thinking, we want to give you the money at half the valuation we promised. We're like, half the valuation? We were, it's just a huge success. Like, what are you talking about? So we literally, they wouldn't budge. They knew we needed that money. And this is another lesson <laughs> for your audience. And that is, 
don't tell venture capitalists you desperately need their money because <laughs> they aren't called vulture capitalists for nothing. <laughs> they were literally going to squeeze us. And uh, we, we decided, okay, either we take their money or we run off a cliff. And, but then we're like, do we want these people on our board of directors? Do we want them as our partners? Like we can't even trust them. Like they don't live up to their word. They're sleazy. Uh, so we decided we're just walking and we walked right out the door wow. through you. And it felt really good until we were out the door. <laughs> and realized we had no money. It, is... <laughs> it was literally, you know, a few weeks before Christmas, everything shuts down over the holidays in, in Silicon Valley. People don't come back until mid January and we have no money. <laughs> it was like torture. Um, another lesson I learned is we walked away from them, but we should have walked away from them the first time we had a red flag. When they told us they would delay uh, six weeks to fund us after promising they would fund us, we should have walked away. Literally, if you're an entrepreneur out there, you need to take control. You need to set the deadlines, not let them set the deadlines. And if they at any time do not live up to their word, run, <laughs> run for the exits. That was an, another big mistake we made. And a third mistake we made was we didn't have other investors lined up. We were so focused on getting our product ready to launch, and we thought this was in the bag that we had stopped talking to all other investors. Another huge mistake. So we were left high and dry. The, the holidays come, most depressing ones ever. <laughs> we had tickets to CES, so we were going because we had booked them anyway, but we ended up downgrading to the sleaziest hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. It was horrible. We had almost no energy to get out of bed and do anything. We were just so depressed. Get back to Silicon Valley. I'd been, but I didn't give up. Like, this is our company. Like, this is being an entrepreneur. So I'd been asking around. I finally got in the door to somebody. It wasn't a venture capital firm, but it was a, a big public company. It was called Macro Media which is now Adobe. So everybody knows it as Adobe. I'll just call it Adobe. So went into the Adobe and they, uh, the president of Adobe says, you know, I'm really interested in what you have. I want to invest. I was like, ah, great. He goes, but I need to know, can you make this work with our new product? It's called Flash. And I was wow. like, Flash? Absolutely. No problem. I didn't know if we could do it, but no problem. <laughs> we will get this done. Like we can figure it out. Give us the money. And he's like, well, I'll give you the money, but we can't lead the round. We, I was like, oh, painful. He goes, well, you need a top Silicon Valley VC firm to lead the round. But I'll tell you what, I'll make some introductions. And if they lead the round, we'll co-invest. So I was like, okay, make the introductions. You know, mid-January comes around. People are finally back, takes us in to one of the top firms on Sand Hill Road, which is where all the VCs are in Silicon Valley. We go in there and he actually, the president, came along with me to the pitch. He was there. And I was like, why is he coming to this pitch? He must be a busy man with a public company and all that he does. The reason he was coming to the pitch was because he wanted to see the investor's reaction. If this investor shot us down, he wasn't going to make any more introductions. I figured it out. He, if I failed, he, so all the pressure is on again. Like literally, this is the chance I got. This is a shot. I mean, we're out of money. Like I had begged our employees to stay. We had deferred paying hosting fees. We were running on fumes. And, and I was like, we got to close this deal. So I pitched my heart out. Like do everything I can. Don't mention that we're, you know, almost about to go bankrupt. <laughs> Just If they would have asked me what our bank account was, I would have had to tell them, but they didn't ask. So I pitch my heart out. At the end of the pitch, the investor, I look at him and he's completely stone faced. No reaction whatsoever. I was like, oh man. And he goes, excuse me, I'll be back. And he gets up and leaves. He just walks out. I don't know what's going on. So I'm waiting. I look at the president over there and he doesn't know what's going on. Uh, the investor comes back, he sits back down, he looks at me, and he says, we don't want to give you $5 million. And he slides a piece of paper forward. We want to give you $7 million. I'm like, whoa, 
<laughs> this is awesome. Like I would have been happy with five, like seven is amazing. But then I start thinking, you know, oh, boo, 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 boo. You know what? First of all, uh, why is he giving me a term sheet on my first pitch? Like all the other investors I had to talk to for weeks and weeks and months sometimes and they didn't invest. Why is he giving me a term sheet right now? Another lesson for your audience. The reason he's giving me the term sheet is because I mentioned during my pitch that they were the first venture capital firm that this company, Macromedia, now Adobe, was introducing us to, meaning they would introduce us to other ones. And if you want to close a deal and you're an entrepreneur out there, I have a rule, and that is you have to get the, their fear of losing the deal greater than their fear of losing their money. <laughs> if they are more <laughs> afraid to lose the deal, they will write you a check on the spot. He didn't want to let me leave. He was afraid I'd get another introduction, close a deal with somebody else. He'd be cut out. That's how investors' minds work. So I'm sitting there. The investor's across from me. He wants to give me $7 million. I started to think quickly. And I said to him, no, I don't want $7 million. Now, why would I say that? Because I needed a bargaining chip. I needed the money fast. So I turned to him and I said, I don't want seven, but I'll tell you what, I will compromise with you. I will take $6 million of your money if you can close the deal in two weeks. See, because I didn't want to beg him to close the deal in two weeks. I wanted him to be motivated to close the deal in two weeks. He turned to me, he looked at me, he said, absolutely, we will close this deal in two weeks. And we shook on it. And he lived up to his word. Two weeks later, we had the money in the bank. My God, we got over a hurdle. <laughs> what a fantastic story. So that's the secret to closing the deal. Just so I can understand that nuance, how did you make losing the deal so, because you didn't particularly plan it, but now that you've you've looked at it, perhaps you did, but how do we structure that, that what do we have to throw out that makes it that they want that deal so bad and it's more important to get the deal than, than losing the money. I, I, I just want to make sure I really got that. That's an incredible point. Yes. So there are, there's a lot of points. I actually go much deeper on the psychology of investors in my book, surviving a startup. I go like really deep because I think it's really important as an entrepreneur for you to get inside your investor's head. And this is true of any sales. It doesn't matter if you're selling a big ticket item like shares in your company or you're selling your products, you know, you need to get in their head. Another thing with investors is really important is they need to know, even if, you know, even if you don't have a lot of other people lined up they need to know you can walk away from the deal. So it's really important for you as the entrepreneur to set the parameters of the deal, to steer the negotiation. You, When you are negotiating with them, you have to remember you're not at their mercy. They may have the money, but you can make the rules. Like usually the, the golden rule is whoever has the gold makes the rules, but that's not really how life works. Life works is whoever makes the rules makes the rules. So I have in later, you know, once I learned this, I put it to use in all sorts of different sales situations. Like, you know, for other investors in the past, I'd go into top tier VC firms and I'd literally say to them, you need to close the deal in two weeks. They'd go, why? And they go, well, because I can't spend forever talking to you. We're really busy. Like we have a lot going on. Instantly that puts in their head. I'm not telling them I have other deals on the table because if you tell them you have another deal on the table and you don't, and it doesn't happen, you look really bad. <laughs> you just lied to them, first of all, so you've lost all credibility. And secondly, you, you know, you, you not even achieved what you said you would. So uh, it's really important. You don't have to say you have other deals on the table. You just have to say, my time is really valuable. And I really need to know if you're serious because I only want serious investors in the deal. From day one, I have a, this is another one of my rules of getting investors to commit. It's called, uh, it's called, Prince Charming rule. So every investor is a frog. Every investor is a frog. And every entrepreneur goes up to that frog and kisses the frog, hoping it will turn into Prince Charming, make their dreams come true, carry them away, give them all the money. However, if you have kissed a frog three times and it's still a frog, <laughs> that investor will never be your Prince Charming. Okay? <laughs> so you know, usually I give investors like three really good chances to invest. You know, I meet with them, do my whole pitch. And then 
even on the first meeting, I will ask for the money. Like ask for the money. Don't be shy. Like, are you ready to invest? Is there anything else you need? Usually they won't give it to you on the first meeting. Go back the second time. You know, make sure if they have anybody else, bring them along to the meeting so I can talk to them. And when they're in front of you, um, uh, ask for the money. Doing the whole, is there anything else you need to make a decision to invest? They don't invest. Maybe they need to go meet other partners and stuff. Okay, let them know the third meeting is their last kiss. <laughs> like they will, they will either they have their chance to invest, but you're not going to keep coming back. And this will save you huge amounts of time and very few deals. It sort of goes up exponentially. By the third or fourth time, you're at the peak of the chance of them closing. And then after that, people's attention spans are short. They start to lose interest. Even if they were super interested, you're just set. They, you know, they haven't done it. And from my experience with all investors, really, if it's the right fit, they move fast. If it's not the right fit, uh, they will take their time. And so they'll, which means they'll never invest. So things that are going to happen usually happen quickly. And you don't want all that mental baggage of trying to think, you don't want to delude yourself into thinking that they're going to eventually invest. If they just don't commit within the first few weeks, just move on. That's the rule. Those are amazing points, Stephen. And I love he who makes the rules, makes the rules. <laughs> it's so simple. It's so brilliant. That's great. And we've got to go now, but I definitely want to encourage the audience here. Get Stephen's books, get into the psychology, whether you think you need the funds now or you may have something that needs it later. There's a lot to learn about surviving the startup. And there's a lot to learn about financing it and running it. Highly encourage that. And just Stephen, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing this, surviving a startup. And we can find you at founderspace.com, whether it's one S or two. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Truly, you gave us so many gems. We're very grateful for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me while I featured an elite entrepreneur who took his vision to reality. This was such a good interview. I found lots of gems and great advice here on negotiations, bringing in funding, and all sorts of good stuff, surviving a startup. We talked about so many things, and in no particular order, we talked about the myth about launching a startup, what's the most important thing for entrepreneurs to do at first. We talked about some of the deadly mistakes entrepreneurs make. And what should entrepreneurs know before they start? Should you start with a big idea or a small one? Should you see about being self-sustained and just rolling along? Or should you work on developing a platform? Oh, this is such good information about really creating a big business. And we talked about the secrets to closing almost every deal. This is my favorite. He who makes the rules makes the rules. And we talked about so much, much more. This was great. I want to thank you for spending some time with us. It's all about helping you move on your journey to success. So thanks. And remember, just take action. Success awaits those who persevere and remain steadfast despite the odds. Sow good seeds, do good deeds, and join me on the next episode of The Tony D'Urso Show. We hope you've enjoyed this week's edition of the Tony D'Urso Show with his key influencers. Be sure to tune in again next Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel.